Hi, my name is Aquilas, and today I'm going to talk to you about why the Myers Briggs and Young's functions aren't BS. Reason number one, the map is not the land. Just like a map of a place isn't the same thing as the land that it's actually depicting, when we begin to talk about the Myers-Briggs and more importantly, Young's functions, it's important to consider that what the test is isn't the same thing as what the theory is. And in fact, the theory of personality is more important than the actual test that's measuring it. Our understanding about what personality is, is really a conceptual one. That is to say, it's a theoretical one. It's a qualitative understanding. It's not an understanding that relies on a test being able to measure it. Now we do want to measure it because we want to be able to validate those theories, but only in so much as being able to refer back to them to say, well, that is a good theory. So it's important that as we go forward, we think differently about what the test is and what the theory is. And if the theory is correct, but the test isn't capturing that in some way, that's not a problem with the theory, that's a problem with the test. Reason number two, while the Myers-Briggs relies heavily on type and trait, Jung, in his theories, talks about functions. He describes people entirely as functions, though he does give some discussion to how the other more minor functions will show up, even if in unconscious ways. So Jung talks about extroverted sensors, extroverted intuitives, extroverted thinkers, and extroverted feelers, and introverted sensors, introverted intuitives, introverted thinkers, and introverted feelers. The Myers-Briggs strictly talks about introverts and extroverts, intuitives and sensors, thinkers and feelers, and they added a fourth trait, if you want, perceivers and judgers. However, most people who've taken a Myers-Briggs, I should say a quote Myers-Briggs, have not actually taken the real Myers-Briggs, which is a proprietary test or assessment. In fact, unless you've been given it by a psychologist who's been trained and licensed to give it, or were given it as part of some company or uh, maybe a hiring process to get a job. Generally, those are the only ways that people are going to have access to the actual Myers-Briggs, maybe in some research. Otherwise, you've probably taken something online that's Myers-Briggs-like, but which may be actually based more on Jung's theories. If you search Myers-Briggs test, you'll get 10, 20 different responses uh, of different tests you can take most of which, if not all of which, are not the actual Myers-Briggs. I point this out because some of those tests actually are relying on Jung's functions and aren't thinking about typology just in terms of traits. They're also thinking about them in terms of functions, which can be reconstructed into type to give you the, that four-letter code uh, that we're used to seeing with the Myers-Briggs in particular, you know, the INTJ or the ESFP, etc. This leads me to reason number three, which is that some of the criticism of the Myers-Briggs is that it strictly puts you into one trait or the other. You get your four-letter type code and you're either an introvert or an extrovert. You're either an intuitive or a sensor, a thinker or a feeler, or a judger or a perceiver. And so some of the criticism of the Myers-Briggs is that, hey, all of us have some of those things all of the time. Feelers have thoughts and can make decisions based on logic and intuitives can actually see the world for what it is. But the Myers-Briggs code makes it look like that you only have one or the other trait. 
Now, again, this brings me back to the map is not the land. Everyone has all of the functions. And even if you rely on prefer one more than the other, the others are still going to show up in your life, even if that's in an unconscious way. That is to say, you do need to unconsciously perceive a thing uh, in a sensory way before you can make intuitions about it. It wouldn't make sense otherwise. You can, of course, if you're a feeler, logic your way through a situation, but you still might just do what you feel like doing, and on and on and on. The Myers-Briggs type code, or a Jungian typology test, is just revealing to you your preference, or the thing that you usually do. Some personality tests, namely the Big Five or the Neopi, take those scales like introvert, extrovert, neuroticism, openness, etc. And they take those scales and they show you that measurement on a continuous graph. That is to say, they say that you're 20% extroverted and you're 50% uh, neurotic, etc., etc. Well, the Myers-Briggs doesn't do that. I mean, it just decided on a different model in order to present its results to uh, the people who are taking it. They decided that if you go on this side of the line, you're going to be a feeler. And if you go on this side of the line, uh, we're going to classify you as a thinker. Now, again, if you look back to Young's theories, this doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have any of the other trait. But in order to produce a type code, they needed to put you in one box or the other. And so criticisms of the Myers-Briggs that say, well, it separates people into groups that are artificial and assumes that if you're an extrovert, you don't have any introverted qualities, just don't understand what the Myers-Briggs is representing in terms of Jung's typology theories. Reason number four, uh, the article that many cite in order to prove that the Myers-Briggs uh, isn't a reliable and valid test uh, has some holes in it, we'll say. What you should know about this article is that its specific purpose is to critique the Myers-Briggs as a way to help people make career decisions. Its main purpose was to critique a previous article where the author said that the Myers-Briggs was a great way for career counselors to help their clients find the career that was right for them. So that's the main purpose of the article, and I just wanted to give you some context to it before we go on to talk about how it's problematic otherwise. For one, it makes the error that we just talked about. It assumes that because the Myers-Briggs gives you a four-letter type code, that you are forevermore destined to be only extroverted or only uh, a feeler. Also, the numbers that they report in order to prove that the Myers-Briggs has poor reliability actually show that it has pretty good reliability. They report that when the initial score was within the intermediate range, that is to say when people were close to the middle. So if you were taking the introvert or extrovert scale and you scored close to introvert and close to extrovert, that is you were somewhere close to that middle range. When the initial score was within the intermediate range, 32% of the introvert extrovert, 25% of the sensors and intuitives, and 29% of the thinkers and feelers shifted on the second testing. Well, 32% there is their biggest number, which means that 68% didn't shift. So from 75 to 68% of people didn't shift on their second testing of the Myers-Briggs. That's pretty good in my book, especially considering they were trying to really stick it to the Myers-Briggs by only looking at those people who were already close to the center line. That says nothing about the people who were firmly extroverted or who were firmly introverted. In addition to that, we would expect people's personality to change to some degree. This article also tries to make the point that you're born with your set functions or your set type. I've seen nowhere in the literature of my reading of Jung or other people who study or test with the Myers-Briggs that your personality is supposed to be stable forever, certainly since you were born. That just makes no sense. In fact, 
a test should be sensitive, in my opinion, to a changing mood because mood is so closely related to personality. And a lot of the tests that are trying to assess your personality also end up tapping into some of how you're feeling that day, right? I'm generally a happy person. Well, even if you are and you're feeling pretty bad that day, you might mark a three instead of a five. And so a test should, to some degree, be sensitive to a changing mood. And we wouldn't expect that somebody coming in uh, and taking a personality test is going to get the exact same score over time. In my opinion, that would be a bad personality test because it's not tapping deeply enough into what's going on for that person day to day and over a long period of time. Now, you could control for this in some ways, of course. You could give a mood test of some sort, or as some proponents of the Myers-Briggs suggest, giving some broad pathology test in order to control for pathology or mood disturbances over time and from test to test. If you did that, then you would expect for the Myers-Briggs or any personality test to show more stability than it did if you didn't control for those things. But simply saying that because a person comes in on Wednesday and they take the Myers-Briggs and then two weeks from Wednesday, they come in and they take it again and they're a little more thoughtful today or they're a little more intuitive today or they're a little more introverted today. And to say that that demonstrates that the Myers-Briggs or the Jungian functions aren't a good theory. Again, the test is not the theory. To say that that makes it a not a good test or a good theory, I think in my book is an extreme overreach. And the last thing I'll say about this article is that it actually concludes by telling you that many of the problems with the Myers-Briggs in particular aren't problems that are isolated to the Myers-Briggs. In fact, one of the things it leaves you with is that Quote, therefore, conclusions regarding the superiority of either the Myers-Briggs type indicator or other instruments are, at present, premature. Number five, personality as described by Jungian theory represents a non-linear dynamic system. Now, let me start by saying I'm no expert in this stuff at all, and I've been doing some studying over it based on a conversation I heard by a scientist named Dario Nardi. Now, a nonlinear dynamic system can be defined as something that, one, is the product of multiple different interacting forces, two, has multiple attractor states, and three, can change between these states over time. Now, let's see if personality, as described through Jungian functions, fits these three parameters. Number one, is personality the product of multiple different interacting forces? Of course it is. If we just think about nature and nurture, we've already fulfilled that parameter. In fact, we can broaden the idea of nurture to mean a lot of different things. The relationship that you have with your parents, the friends that you had growing up, your education, the product of the religion you were raised in, and on and on and on. All of these things are going to come together to form your personality. And so that first perimeter is an easy one. Number two, has multiple attractor states. Now, what does this mean? An attractor state is something that has a quality about it, but isn't entirely defined. That is to say, it's a tendency. It's a way of being that seems similar to itself, but has no real center. We can think of the Jungian functions as those attractor states. That is to say, moving from introvert to extrovert type behaviors. All of us, even if we were to define ourselves as introverts, get to a point where we want to get out of our heads and get into the world again. If you're really introverted, that line may be farther out than if you're somewhat introverted and you tend to mostly want to keep to yourself and keep inside of your own thoughts, but pretty regularly feel the need to go out and experience the world, even if that's just your immediate environment. All of us, even if we're thinkers, have times when we make decisions based on our feelings. 
So these functions can serve as those theoretical attractor points, points at which we vacillate. But when we go from one to the other, there is a clear switch, right? There is a clear way in which we can feel like we're making decisions based on our feelings and a clear way in which we can understand that we're making feelings based on logic. Most of us can't do both. That is to say, at one time. You might consider both, right? You might make a checklist of, well, this is going to hurt so-and-so's feelings and I'm going to be really tired after, but it's going to be really good for my job and it makes sense at my age, whatever, right? Those are two different ways of coming to a judgment or deciding on a thing. And we have a way that we might prefer one. We might tend to always go with our gut, go with our feeling, go with what's going to make an emotional impact in some way. But we can each understand that we will vacillate between these two states. And maybe we stay over here many times, but eventually you need to make that logical decision. And eventually, you know, your heart shows up. And that fulfills parameter number three that we can change between those attractor states over time, that we're not always a feeler. We're not consistently and always making decisions just based on how we feel. Sometimes that switch flips and we're making decisions based on what's logical. We're not always in ourselves, even if we would define ourselves as an introvert. Sometimes that switch flips and we get out of ourselves. So in my mind, this sets up personality is not being a linear system, but a nonlinear dynamic system. That is to say, our ability to predict where exactly we're going to be in terms of our personality at any given time is pretty impossible. But we can begin to understand the trends over time that make up what our personality in a broad way looks like. Broadly, you make decisions with your feelings, and broadly, you tend to be in yourself more than out in the world, and broadly, you tend to perceive things in an intuitive way. But of course, you do all those other things sometimes too. When exactly you're going to switch? I can't tell you that, but I can tell you that over a long period of time, you're probably going to prefer this way over this way, and that might make some dictates about how your life shapes up and how people overall perceive you as a person and as a personality. This is known as a phase transition or a regime shift, and it's a thing that's unique to Jungian function theory that other more modern theories don't seem to understand. Other personality scales would rather say that if you sometimes act like an introvert and you sometimes act like an extrovert, that you are somewhere in the middle of introvert and extrovert, the so-called, quote, ambivert. But that doesn't really get at the complexity of the fact that sometimes you're fully extroverted and sometimes you're fully introverted, not that you're always lukewarm introvert extrovert that doesn't make any sense right sometimes you keep to yourself and you're in your own space and you're in your own feelings and you're in your own thoughts or whatever it is whereas at other times you're out in the world and interacting and engaging with what's going on in the here and now it's not that you're constantly somehow in between that space no, you switch back and forth. You make phase transitions between being extroverted and being introverted. Other tests of personality rely on a linear understanding of personality, which is a limited one. Humans are among the most complex, if not the most complex thing ever to be in creation. That our personality would be able to be described, that the way that we are in the world and with ourselves would be able to be described in a linear and deterministic way is pretty ridiculous. We can't even plot the course of a hurricane to the degree that some scientist and some psychologist would have you think that we should be able to predict personality. 
We just don't work that way. If the wind shifts or something unexpected happens, if we get a new job or there's a death in the family or we get sick or who knows what happens to us, of course that's going to determine whether we're in ourselves or we're making decisions based on our feelings versus our thoughts or if we're having a lot of attention to detail or if we're allowing ourselves to dream past what's going on. A theory that can't capture the complexity of how a real person works and isn't trying to just narrow us down to some average isn't, in my view, a good theory of how humans and persons really operate. It makes good math because now we can find an easy average and you always average out to the same thing, but it doesn't describe the complexity and the dynamic nature in which we truly operate. Reason number six, Jungian functions are actually backed up by neuroscience. The scientist Dario Nardi has found that each of the cognitive functions corresponds to specific patterns of brain activity. This means that, say, those that are extroverted intuitives show a pattern of brain activity that is common amongst other extroverted intuitives and that introverted sensors show a pattern of brain activity that is similar to patterns in other introverted sensors. Now, as I was saying, everybody has each of the functions. Everybody shows all of these different types of brain activity. But what's fascinating is, is that if you're an introverted intuitive, you're gonna show that pattern of brain activity more often than other people, even though they can sometimes show it. What this means is, is that really we're tracking pathways in our brains that are preferential roads to where we're trying to go. And so that we come into a situation, and if you're an extroverted sensor, well, that's the first and easiest pathway that your brain is going to try to take, to take that in, to understand, to make some predictions about what's going on and what's happening uh, in and around. But if you're an introverted intuitive, you're going to light up a different set of brain pathways. What he said about this is that usually we're going to try to meet a situation with our preferred type of function, our preferred type of pattern. But if that doesn't work, we may try a different pattern. What this suggests is, is that each of us has a preferred set of cognitive functions that we tend to take into every situation. Now, some situations are going to require a different set of cognitive functions than the ones that we prefer to use. What Dario Nardi has said is that when we meet these situations, we'll probably first try to tackle it with our preferred set of functions. But when that doesn't work, our brain activity suggests that we'll try maybe the better way to take take on the situation. Let's say somebody's asking you uh, to fold uh, a pillowcase in a very particular way, and you're an intuitive person, and maybe you don't pay as much attention to the detail and they come back by and they say no this isn't good enough and maybe you try again and you still don't get it and then they come by a third time and they really put the pressure on and maybe this time you'll switch to a different function in order to use a function that's better at paying attention uh, to those very particular details that sensors are better at doing. Now, we're not going to be as good at this, and often it does take a little bit of pressure for us to access or make use of those other functions, but we can get to them. And our brain patterns, according to Nardi, show this, show that we have a preferred set of patterns that an extroverted intuitive is going to come to a situation with. But if that doesn't work, maybe he'll try it in a second way that he's not as good at, but he can still access it. And if he has to make use of that function, he can and he will. Reason number seven, the cognitive functions and even the Myers-Briggs are backed up by a rich theoretical underpinning. Unlike some more modern personality tests, the Myers-Briggs isn't just based on self-report and quantitative methodology. It began back in the 1920s based on real human observations in therapeutic and non-therapeutic settings. That is to say, this theory arose as a theory. And if you remember back to the point I made earlier, it's not about the numbers, it's about the theory. The numbers only help prove the theory. And so if you've got a theory 
that adds up really nicely and always reports averages because people self-report on themselves in similar ways, but may or may not know how they actually behave. That's one thing. But if you've got a theory that's based on self-report, to some degree, of course, the Myers-Briggs is a self-report test, but it's also based on outside observations of how humans actually behave and has been refined over years and years and years and decades and nearly a century now, well, that to me is a more impressive thing than just a test that we've come up with in the last 20 years that is relatively stable over time. Of course, looking back at the article I talked about, not so much more than the Myers-Briggs, in fact. Reason number eight. Even while trying to account for all of the complexity we've talked about so far, the Myers-Briggs still does a pretty good job of giving specific descriptions of its different types. Now, some criticism of the Myers-Briggs assert that the descriptions of the types are vague and nonspecific. This is ridiculous on the face of itself. If you've read your Myers-Briggs type and compared it to another Myers-Briggs type, you'll understand that those types are quite different. In fact, one of the best ways it is said to actually find your Myers-Briggs type is to just go read the descriptions of all the types. And the one that hits home for you is the one that probably is your type. Again, the theory is more important than the test. And so if you find a description of yourself that really hits home for you, it doesn't matter what the test says. Yes, tests are imperfect. If you find a theory that you feel like fits you and you can validate with that with some other people who know you and say, yeah, that sounds like you, well, then that is going to be the best fit for you, despite what any test says. My point here is to dispute the claim that those descriptions are altogether similar. Of course, if you're just one letter off from another type, in some cases, those descriptions are going to be pretty similar, and that may be because you have the same set of functions, just in a slightly different order, or you only have one different function that maybe doesn't show up so much in how you act or portray yourself to the world. But overall, the 16 types that the Myers-Briggs provides are quite different from one another, and it is a bit absurd to say, that the Myers-Briggs is just some type of horoscope that's giving a broad description that anybody could fit into. If you're an intuitive, go and read probably any of the sensor descriptions and you will find that you don't sound like any of those people. If you're a feeler, go read some of the thinkers and vice versa. The types are pretty different and they do a pretty good job of describing differences in personalities. The only Things that tend to be most similar is if, say, you just flip the I from an E. If you're an ENFP and you go read an INFP, you will recognize a lot of those things, a lot of those characteristics within yourself. But then if you go read the ENFP, it will sound a lot more like you. Now, if you go read an ESTJ, you're going to look at that one and say, nope, that's not me. In fact, I could never see myself doing X, Y, and Z. Reason number nine, the Myers-Briggs and cognitive functions describe both positive and negatives of each type and function. Now, some people find this to be a problem. That is to say that everybody gets a happy side to their personality type. Well, unless you think that some people are naturally just born terrible or evil, which isn't my opinion and I don't think is validated by any science either, then you should expect that each of the types are going to have positive and negative qualities. Now, some people think, including that Fox video, that they only give you positives. Well, if you've read a good description of your type, and maybe not just from a site that wanted to give you a rosy ideal of, of what your personality is, if you just Google what your personality type is according to some, quote, Myers-Briggs test, you'll find a few that are giving you the upside of your type and the downside of your type. This is a quality that I think a good personality test would have. It shouldn't say that if you're way neurotic, that that's a bad thing, or that if you're not neurotic at all, well, that's a pretty good thing. And reason number 10, the proof is in the pudding. The fact that the Myers-Briggs has been around for nearly 100 years and is still the most widely used personality test in the world 
and that people all over the internet are talking about their Myers-Briggs in a sophisticated way that matches who they are and that they're finding communities around their Myers-Briggs type because of shared interest, shared perspectives, and shared ways of seeing the world, well, that should say something. So even if you try to find fault with a quantitative methodology of the Myers-Briggs in particular, that still doesn't A, speak to the functions, and B, speak to the fact that people really can see themselves in these different personality types. That means something. That means we've tapped into something that people are identifying with. One of the things that Jung has said about his interpretations broadly is that if it, you shouldn't be too afraid to give a bad interpretation. Because if it's a bad interpretation, over time, the person will realize it doesn't fit them and they will stop wearing it. They'll stop using it. It won't mean anything anymore because they will have seen through it. Again, the fact that this test has endured for nearly 100 years means that it is tapped into something that is enduring, that hasn't just been washed away because it turned out to be nonsense. This is not to mention the theory's ability to project itself even onto fictional characters. Now, while this may at first seem trivial, the ability for a personality theory to be projected onto fictional characters and create realistic characters suggests that the theory is actually capturing the different ways in which a human personality can present itself. This is in line with Jung's idea that psychology and literature and theater were two sides of the same coin that one had to do with unwrapping something that was already put together, and the other had to do with putting together something that needed to look like it had already been wrapped. To my knowledge, other personality theories don't allow you to take them and then flip them over and create a type of believable character who's different than another believable character. In my mind, this is further evidence that the Myers-Briggs and Young's functions are good theories of personality, even if some of the tests that are trying to capture them aren't doing such a good job. So thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. Or if you just want to argue with me, that's fine too. I do plan on doing more Myers-Briggs and Jungian function videos in the future. So if you have any particular questions or videos that you'd like to see, uh, please also let me know that down in the comments. Or you can tweet me at Aqualus. And do subscribe if you want to see more. Take care.